Last week, we read the story of Lazarus together. It's an amazing story, the story of Lazarus. Jesus returns to the house of his friends, Mary and Martha, four days after their brother and Jesus' friend had died and, and, and was sealed inside of his burial tomb. At Jesus' request, despite warnings that after four days it is not going to smell good in there, they roll away the stone from the entrance of Lazarus's tomb, and, and Jesus calls out to his friend, and he commands him to come out. And at Jesus' command, Lazarus climbs out of the tomb, still wrapped from head to toe in his grave clothes. As I said, it is an amazing story. But as we follow the recommended readings for the season of Lent, these readings all seem to tell a happier story than the scriptures do. If you follow the recommended lectionary readings, they would have us jump directly from Lazarus' resurrection to Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. The alternative reading for this week, rather than celebrating Palm Sunday, is, is to jump from Lazarus' resurrection right to the, the story of the Passion. And, and the crucifixion. But as I mentioned at the end of last week's service, there, there is an important part of the story of Lazarus that, that regardless of which way we go following the lectionary passages, there, there's an important part of, of the Lazarus story that gets skipped over. And so today we're going to begin right where we left off last week with the story of Lazarus. And, and then we will follow Jesus into Jerusalem because, because both of these pieces are important to our understanding of, of how things are set in motion for the events that lead up to Good Friday and Easter. And in fact, it's the reading of the second half of Lazarus' story that explains to us why Lazarus' story is routinely a part of, uh, of Lent and our preparation for Easter. So let's, let's rejoin Lazarus' story right where we stopped last week. Lazarus rises from the dead. He climbs out of the tomb. Jesus asks folks to, to help take off his grave clothes. Everyone is amazed. And Scripture says, Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. And, and that's where we ended. And that's nice, but that isn't the end of the story, because had we continued reading the story, this is what we hear from John chapter 11. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. But... Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Now, now, just for your reference, they reference the chief priests and the Pharisees calling a meeting of the Sanhedrin. The, the majority of the Sanhedrin were the Sadducees. So we got, we got everybody. The Sadducees and the Pharisees and the chief priests and, and everybody's there. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is, here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for one of you, better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. 
He did not say this on his own, but as the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and to make them one. And so, from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. Now, let, let, me, let me pause a minute. Passover is a big deal. Passover is, is one of the three or four national celebrations where pilgrimage to the temple is required. Okay? And, now, now, and, for the, and if you were, were busy or poor and could afford to, and would skip some of those celebrations, Passover is the one that you would not skip. Everybody came to Jerusalem for Passover, and they came a week early because they had to perform all of the purification rituals that allowed them to go into the temple. And, and usually what happens is that over the course of a year from the last Passover, you have become ceremonially unclean because you touched, at some point, touched a corpse. Your neighbor died, your family member died, but if, if you, were, if you had, had suffered from corpse pollution, the ceremony for purification took a week. So, pilgrims for Passover would come often a week early so they could perform all of the ceremonies and purifications that they needed so that they could go into the temple on the day of Passover. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus. And as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, what do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. And so then we come to the Palm Sunday part of the story. And sometimes when we read the Palm Sunday part of the story, we we read that story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, and, and we wonder how big a deal that really was. We wonder if anybody really noticed the cheering and the shouting and the waving of palm branches. And this is especially true when we skip over that part that we just read, when we skip over the end of the Lazarus story. But when we read the second half of the Lazarus story, we see that the chief priests and the Pharisees were waiting for Jesus to arrive on Passover. They were watching for Jesus' arrival. They had already decided that Jesus needed to die. And so all of the palm, waving palm branches and all of the shouts of Hosanna only confirmed their decision and cemented their determination. But... From the point of view of the disciples and the other followers of Jesus, Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem was a joyous occasion. They had a completely different perspective than the Pharisees had. So different was their perspective, in fact, that, that, that it almost seems like a different story. The people saw Jesus as a prophet. They hoped 
that he would be the military messiah that would would overthrow the roman occupation and and would lead israel into a, a renewed greatness and prominence and notoriety and that's the story that we hear in matthew chapter 21 as they approached jerusalem and came to bethpage on the mount of olives jesus sent two disciples saying to them go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her untie them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you say that the lord needs them and he will send them right away this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet say to daughter zion see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt the fool of a donkey the disciples went and they did as jesus had instructed them they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for jesus to sit on a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees spread them on the road the crowds that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted say it with me hosanna see i told you this was coming and you're not ready hosanna say it hosanna hosanna they shouted hosanna to the son of david Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. You can, you can put him down now. <laughs> and, and when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And they asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is Jesus, a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And, and all of these acclamations tell us two things. First, they tell us about the expectations and the hopes of the people and who they thought Jesus was. And second, they explain to us why the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other members of the ruling council saw Jesus as both a problem and a threat. Hosanna means save. If you're an English teacher, it's the, it's the emphatic form of save. So it's save exclamation point. Uh, it, it, it means uh, translated into uh, perhaps save us. It's, it's the kind of a thing that you would shout to a military leader or to a political leader in order to praise them, but also, also to express your hope in their leadership. Son of David was often used as the title for the kings of Israel or the chief priests of Israel. It, it was used figuratively for leaders that were not related to David, but, but it was also used uh, uh, literally for kings that were genetically descended from David. Waving palm branches also made a political statement. Again, this was something you did to welcome kings and royalty, conquering heroes or other important persons. Palm branches in particular may have had, as I mentioned with the children, a nationalistic symbol of Israel. Those sorts of demonstrations were sometimes specifically organized by local leaders to welcome the, the, the Roman generals or senators or Caesars who were visiting in the area so that they were appropriately welcomed and would see that the subjugated nations loved Rome and were obedient to Caesar. In fact, if you read Josephus, there were more than one occasion upon which a visiting dignitary felt as if he was not sufficiently welcomed and just sent the army and killed a bunch of people. Taken together, this probably looked like the sort of thing that could start a popular uprising against Roman authority. 
it had the potential for that sort of uprising. And, and, and because it had the potential for that sort of uprising, this was exactly why a Roman fortress, the Fortress Antonia, was physically attached to the temple courts on the Temple Mount. Worse, the Romans stored the vestments of the high priest in the fortress Antonia. And so whenever there was a special worship service in which the high priest had to perform his official duties, he had to go to the Romans and ask for his clothing. If the Romans were sufficiently perturbed, all they had to do was to deny access to the high priest, and there would be no holy day sacrifice. Just in case you needed some confirmation that the Sanhedrin knew all about all the shouting and the palm branches, Luke records his description of this event, and, and in Luke chapter 19, Luke includes this conversation. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to shut up. And I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. It's a little odd, I think. It's odd that the selected scriptures that we read during each season of Lent always include the story of Lazarus, but skip the part where we hear the angry voices of Jerusalem's leaders. It's precisely because of the resurrection of Lazarus and the way in which that, that his resurrection causes even more people to follow Jesus. It's precisely because this action of Jesus angers the Sanhedrin and spurs them into action that, that the story of Lazarus becomes a vital element of the Easter story. In the minds of Jerusalem's leaders, Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem and what is often referred to in the church as, as his triumphal entry only confirmed and solidified the decision that the Sanhedrin had already made. If they were going to keep the peace, if they were going to keep the Romans from using violence to ensure peace, if they were going to maintain the status quo, if they were going to keep their jobs, their positions, their influence, and their power, if they were, if they were going to retain control of their temple, their worship, and their whole nation, Jesus must die. Jesus must die. 